uh, I don't know quite what the adjective is, very uh, delighted and honored, um, tickled pink to have uh, Maitri here because Maitri was one of our, our star students. He got his PhD here in Southeast Asian, specifically Burmese history, following in the footsteps of his father who also got a, a PhD in Southeast Asian Burmese history and who's also a, a very distinguished career. Um, Maitri Ang Thuyen is now the Associate Professor of Myanmar Southeast Asian History at the National University of Singapore. After receiving his PhD in history from Michigan, he joined the Asia Research Institute at Singapore as a postdoctoral fellow and subsequently moved to the Department of History at NUS. He's written on resistance movements, law, colonialism, nation building, and intellectual history. His publications include A New History of Southeast Asia, which he co-authored with some other distinguished scholars, The Return of the Galon King, History, Law, and Rebellion in Colonial Burma, and A History of Myanmar Since Ancient Times, Traditions and Transformations, which he co-authored with his father. Today his talk is entitled Narrating Change in Contemporary Myanmar, Media Advocacy and Scholarship. on this very familiar <laughs> and cold day. But for me, coming from Singapore, actually, actually, it's quite nice to have the bit of the bite and the chill. Now, I'm sure I'll be over that in about a day or so. Um, but I, I, w I first wanted to thank uh, very much the, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies and uh, Christiane for inviting me, Alan for first talking about things uh, last, uh, last May, I think, for the special um, Michigan ISIS Myma Forum uh, that was held uh, last that's May, right? Um, also, Allison, uh, for arranging everything. I got here safely, uh, despite the wind uh, that everyone has been uh, enduring for the last few days. Um, and I appreciate all of you. And it's very nice to see these old friends and faces. And even a, a current student uh, from NUS is here. Um, it's, it's lovely to, to see the familiar faces. Uh, I was just speaking to Tom earlier. And it was interesting that. 20 years ago, I was doing this, <laughs> actually. Um, and unfortunately, it was not just uh, 20 pounds ago. <laughs> uh, life has been prosperous in all the wrong places. Um, but I think when I speak about this project, I think it's, uh, as it will show, that there is a, a strong intellectual connection still with Michigan. Some of the questions that I had in the seminars with Tom and Vic and in, with John are still very much informing the ways I think about um, Myanmar, also history, um, but also the ways in which we think about um, these ideas. And so I'm very interested in the epistemology of Myanmar, and how we've come to know Myanmar. And this is part of this broader project uh, that I've been working on uh, s since Michigan. One caveat I'd like to raise is that this project is very, very new. It actually started last year with um, with my class for the first time I was able to teach a history of Myanmar um, because of the demand, frankly. Um, everyone's been interested since the recent opening. And um, I had 50 kids come in, which is considered a small class in Singapore, <laughs> uh, for a third year level module. And one of the projects that I um, assigned them was to think about historicizing contemporary events. And out of the types of questions that came from that project, emerged some themes and some familiar ideas about how have we been discussing Myanmar in the last 25 years? How do we know what we know? Which was for me a very Michigan type of question. Um, and so part of these ideas reflect that type of interest in the intellectual construction of Myanmar. And this I still remember, uh, especially from Tom's class, when you were doing your the Aryans in British India at that time, and I still remember the mosaic ethnology, this idea that there was this discourse that was going on in, in, with the Sanskritists, and the idea was that the languages that were emerging, um, the language study, in fact, show, were trying to prove that Indo-European was, in a sense, connected to this biblical story, the Tower of Babel, and so on. In a similar way, I've been thinking that a discourse about Myanmar has been very much in operation in the last 25 years, and it has shaped scholarship and has also shaped 
the way we've been thinking um, about the future and, uh, and, and current events. And so I'd like to share much of that with you today. Normally, I would actually speak about the scholarship um, to situate both myself and, and the current literature. But I have to be quite honest with you, media studies and the study of transnational advocacy is very new to me. I don't know the literature. And so I'll just keep that towards the end um, as, and try to show um, some of the ideas that are emerging from those fields and seeing how that's actually shaping the ways I'm looking at, at this. I wanted to also suggest um, that, that in talking about the critique of advocacy networks, NGOs, and those who are working with, with humanitarian groups, um, it's tricky business because one would then presume that you are essentially taking a position about the very states and positions that these groups are critiquing and challenging. Um, I'm trying to f find my way through this because it's all entangled and uh, frankly I'm not sure about my positioning on this and I will welcome ideas about how I might situate myself in relationship to the type of work that comes out of these practitioners but who are also very much a part of the broader creation of how we understand Myanmar. Let's start off with the present. In 2016, um, in fact, just about a couple weeks ago, the UN, or I think it was about a, week, or about a month ago perhaps, the UN released a, a report um, suggesting that the, that the ethnic disturbances and sectarian violence going on in western Myanmar, in the Rakhine state, um, bordered or was very close to um, ethnic cleansing. Um, and some people were even using the word genocide. And this has been very much on the news whenever we talk about Myanmar. Um, this has been a challenge, of course, for the government because one of their main issues is that they have had a poor, ta a poor time or they haven't figured out how best to articulate uh, this, uh, their solution or their approach to the type of clashes and conflict that are going on between several different groups in, in that area. The government and specifically the military have been blamed for, um, for the violence and killing that followed an attack on police posts um, to the point where 40,000 plus were, were fleeing into um, Bangladesh, um, a place that was not receptive of, of, of these groups. Aung San Suu Kyi, the democracy icon, um, was, has been now starting to be criticized, which you wouldn't have thought about five, ten years ago. She was really the icon of democracy, the, um, the symbol of, of freedom for, for Myanmar, but now she's starting to be criticized um, more directly because of her silence. And so many observers have been surprised by her position or lack of a position. Um, and it's that surprise that has caught my attention. Why are we surprised? In 2015, Going back, the National League for Democracy uh, swept the 2015 elections. The USDP, or the Union Solidarity uh, Development Party, which was the hybrid civilian branch of the military government who was in, in uh, administrative power, stepped down. And Aung San Suu Kyi was able to establish a new administration, which surprised obver observers again. People didn't expect her to actually be able to, to take uh, um, her place in government, nor were they expecting the military to actually pass power over. Again, the surprise was what um, struck my attention. Going back further, when Thane Sain's uh, USDP won the 2010 election and then subsequently launched reforms in 2011, this became, in a sense, and I'm going to borrow from Tom again, uh, it wasn't Indomania, this was Myanmar mania, um, in a sense that, that everything about Myanmar became very exciting. Everyone was interested in opening up. This was the last resource frontier. Um, this was a place where businesses go to invest. This was good for ASEAN. This was good for Asia. And it, sh it was one of, the tr uh, one of the only foreign policy successes that the Obama administration could actually claim. 
It was also a surprise for many because the liberalization program that then started to welcome investments, you know, after 40 to 50 years of, in a sense, economic isolation and opening up the political, uh, political sector as well as the public sphere through, through Internet and, you know, Google and Gmail and Facebook and so forth. Um, it also surprised observers. In, in fact, people had not expected that change could come from above. Most people had thought that change had to come from below when we're talking about democracy. Now, all of these moments of surprise, I think, are connected to, a, in a sense, a conventional view about how we, how we look at the history of the modern state or the history of the uh, post-World War II state. Essentially, what we see is the, between 48 and 1962, we see the, that as a period of a parliamentary democracy. In a sense, democracy is born in Yemen uh, between uh, that short period. But then it's delayed by the intervention of the military in, in 1962, which implements a socialist military civi hybrid civilian government again for the next 20 years. And this current period, 1988 to, to now, is a period of democratic struggle. I think it's this perspective that has caused a lot of the surprise. I think it's this viewpoint, this, um, this way of looking at Myanmar's past that has shaped the way we've understood contemporary events. That's the crux of my argument. It's not actually, frankly, very new. Um, but I, what I'm trying to show is actually how was this, in a sense, engineered or historically constructed. Out of this perspective, come or are produced several binary perspectives or binary structures that have shaped, I think, the way we have looked at Myanmar. And this has been really sort of a black and white picture when really the reality is probably a lot of shades of gray. We've seen, for instance, and talked about it's in the media or, and also in, within our seminars and in our research that's really a situation between authoritarian versus a democratic governance. This has been essentially the main tension. Others have looked at the closed economy versus the open economy. Some have looked at specifically in terms of individuals, Aung San Suu Kyi versus Than Shui, or any of the other generals, or the military in general. And this is a broader sort of story about Myanmar's isolation in the 20th century as opposed to the connected experience it might have had um, had it not strayed in 1962. I love this picture, um, mainly because it sort of epitomizes the sort of, this sort of dichotomy, that here she is in 2012 taking up her seat in the parliament, um, not with a, perhaps the warmest uh, look from her fellow parliamentarians. This conventional view, I think that many in the media, as well as, as well as scholarship for that matter, um, holds is that this assumption was that the military would, would hold on power indefinitely. The actions that they took seemed to indicate, especially um, at the time, um, that they weren't ready to give up power. This became a, the central question. Would they ever do so? Most people never believe them because of the, of the um, severity of their rule, of the imprisonment of, of political dissenters and, and, um, and the random um, the random disappearances of, of, of opponents to, uh, to the, the government and so forth. This was, not, um, this was not a nice regime. And so most felt that they were in it for themselves, and that was it, despite the public claims that they were there to hold power until the, the government was ready to be passed over to civilians. There was a large expectation also that democratic change, or any political change for that matter, could only occur from below. I was with a group, I'm not sure if reps from Michigan were there in 2012. It was with the International Institute of I think, Higher Education. There was a group that took universities all into Myanmar at the time to a very old Russian Soviet hotel by Inyal Lake. And there we were meeting other uh, professors from America who were going through and trying to create library relations and other sorts of uh, relations uh, on an institutional basis. And I was remember hearing from a colleague from American University that she was so surprised that change actually had occurred from the top and, and not from the bottom. And so it sort of reminded me, said, yes, here it is again. We have this idea that 
that political change, and especially democratic change, whatever that means, um, can, can only come from below. And a final aspect of the conventional view is really the stirring picture here of Su Chi uh, behind uh, the fence. She was obviously both a symbol of democracy, a symbol of human rights, and in many ways personified uh, Burma. So just as she was behind bars and needed to be free, so did the entire country seek uh, freedom as well. So some of the broad questions that I've been thinking about um, pertain to these three. Essentially, these are questions of how have we understood Myanmar, and especially how have contemporary affairs been, been shaped um, by some of these ideas and these discourses. I've also been very interested in the role that transnational advocacy networks and the media have played in this historical construction of Myanmar. Very few people have actually raised this question, if, as far as I can tell. There has been um, some research done um, <clears throat> from, the, from those who work on social movements and transnational groups, um, but for historians and those who are coming from the Myanmar side, there's been very few, if any, discussions that have looked at the ways that these types of of views and narratives have produced a historical understanding of what has been going on in Myanmar. And that has been a very exciting and interesting, um, interesting idea to pursue. Um, and finally, my, the broader question is how has scholarship and its knowledge infrastructure contributed to this narrative's influence? And this is also something that I don't think anyone's really looked at as well. This is what I'm hoping to explore. What are the connections between these transnational narratives that are coming by all of these advocacy uh, groups and media, and what is the connection with scholarship? And this stems, again, from my Michigan training, actually, um, uh, which was really promoted uh, for us to really think about how have our narratives shaped the way we've understood it at an intellectual level. So scholars are very much part of this broader story um, in the construction of Myanmar. So these three broad questions shape I think, the way the project will be moving forward. As I've learned from a very business-oriented Singapore, um, one must put their conclusions up first so people don't lose it along the way. And so my preliminary observations uh, seem to be that, that the domestic events that, um, that we've associated with the, de the democracy narrative has really been internationalized within this framework. And it's part of a Cold War framework that I think, um, um, in a sense, is a reflection of the times. And it's that type of relationship that I'm quite interested in. Not to judge it in terms of its accuracy or whether it's, it's, um, it's, uh, its reliance on particular sources, but I'm more interested in how did the, the in international issues of the time and the priorities for, of those scholars and reporters and NGOs and so forth, how did those types of views shape in the way we understood Myanmar? I've, I'm suggesting also that Myanmar's post-World War II history um, also had an ironic effect of creating a coherent notion of what Myanmar was. People were talking about the Myanmar people feel this way. Um, the democracy movement, the opposition group feels uh, uh, speaks in a very coherent uh, way towards their position on particular uh, views of the state government. Was, and that this narrative actually promoted a coherency which had little, I think, little reality on the ground. You had b bonds of community. You had bonds of connectedness um, in terms of the political mo and social movements. But I would also argue that there was huge variation uh, throughout the country that was being lost in this type of narrative. And finally, and this is what um, I think Vic might recognize, or maybe not, um, this is connected to um, th ideas that I saw back in the 1930s, and that through this narrative, we are struck by the idea that Myanmar actors, those involved in these times, seem to be unable to engage in political expression, political action, in terms other than democracy. And I'm not sure if that's, I think that's an oversimplified perspective that hopefully we can un unpack a bit. Democracy, of course, becomes a language and a vocabulary for, articulate, for articulating protest and dissent. 
but for a variety, I would think, reasons and, and, and for a range of motivations that we may not um, be able to see from this simplified perspective. So my current focus for today's talk will be focusing on how has the, these domestic changes since 1988 been internationalized. I want to look at the actual process through which um, transnational media um, and advocacy networks have contributed to this, the articulation of a domestic situation and made it international, made it accessible uh, f um, for a sense for the world. And finally, I want to, and this is I think the most interesting aspect, and this comes from the Singapore side of an influence, is to what extent has this dominant view been shared in Asian media? And this is where the class came in. Because most of the, my cl class obviously are coming from Singapore or from the region. They have a lot of indigenous or Asian languages. So while they were supposed to look at English language newspapers, I also encouraged them to look at other language newspapers, whether there's Chinese or Indian, you know, um, Hindi, Tamil, um, Cambodian, whatever, and to see if the narratives that were coming out um, out of the West resonated with media portrayals um, from other net newspapers. We're still in the process of sorting <laughs> the results out, but I think it would uh, be interesting either way. Whether they resonate or they don't resonate, I think it's very interesting to see these types of, of connections, so we're still waiting. But what was striking for me was just even with uh, the People's Daily out of China, that the, for the first 10, 15 years, the stories were very similar, at least the titles of the articles were. And I'm very pleased to have new graduate students coming in who can speak all sorts of wonderful languages um, so we can promote that topic even further. Um, I, I hope to push the, um, I hope to go through the, the, these five different areas today. Um, I can't remember if I have 45 minutes or 50 minutes, what is the, the norm? I can't remember what it was. 50 minutes or so, okay. Um, so we'll go through uh, these five points and, and hopefully we'll have some time for discussion and, and questions uh, moving forward. Um, the picture that you see here is, um, is signifying um, 8888, a very important moment in the democracy movement's own past, but also it's seen to be a conjuncture, a very important uh, point in modern Myanmar's history, because this was also at the time when the Burma uh, Burmese Socialist Program Party also dissolved and, and the, all the unrest and the conflict started to emerge on, in 88. And so this is very much a part of contemporary modern Yama history and its memory. But I think it's important for those of you who are not as familiar to give some background leading up to these contemporary events. The post-colonial state and it was starting off with, in 1948 when they, uh, had an, uh, when they received independence, um, essentially reboots the colonial institutions um, with far less funding, um, far less capacity uh, to run a government and with ministries and an infrastructure that was still under severe uh, devastation from following the, the war. So in many ways people are actually starting to compare the 1950s with what's going on now. Some of the very questions about Where's the nation going? Which, uh, what sort of system should we be following? Who should be leading and, and so on? What, where's our future and who's, and who's going to be part of this country? What is it to be Myanmar? What is it to be Burmese? These are the very same questions that were starting in the 50s. These are still being asked even today. The national reconciliation process, um, which is a ceasefire uh, initiative, is still trying to, to be resolved uh, with eight different groups having signed and another eight haven't signed. And this has been going on since 1948. The civil union government was a loose political coalition of the AFPFL, the Anti-Fascist People's Freedom League, which was a motley crew of, of wartime parties that were fighting the Japanese. And after, of course, the Japanese left, a vacuum emerged, and they had to be held together. This party for, and the charisma of Aung San pretty much held it together uh, for a very short time. But the divisions and factionalism which I think is probably the, the most severe risk to Myanmar even today, um, was very much starting to present itself and rise to the surface um, during this time. Economically, the, this is the period most people see as being very open and, and, and promote and one that was very connected to the international uh, community. Singaporeans were being trained there in education, 
Um, the schools were seen to be the best, the universities over there. Um, Rangoon was seen to be very cosmopolitan at, at the time. Pan Am flew there. Um, so it was seen to be a very um, important symbol of Asia's post-World War II recovery. But if you reorient yourself to the hinterland, it's a different picture entirely. There you had roving uh, militias, um, ethnic separatists, communists, and so forth, all with different ideas about what the national community should be about. And they were roaming the, in the countryside, and they had control. The government really only had control of, of Rangoon. Civilian government was itself weakened by lots of internal divisions. Um, and of folks who were all part of this class of educated Western Burmese groups. They were all, all having different ideas about who to align with, both internationally as well as domestically. This weakened uh, the civilian government, and I think it still weakens this, the civilian hybrid government uh, today. It became, s I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm fast forwarding here. Uh, it became such a, a challenge for the government that the military stepped in in the coup of 62 established um, the Revolutionary Council. And it was also during the 1950s that the Karens um, began to rebel, as did the Shans and many of the other groups that are still, in, ma in many ways, rebelling um, or having a different idea of what the Myanmar nation should be. They're still um, at it today. So these, are st these challenges that started back then are still very much about the, about the current situation. Between 62 and 87, we had a, essentially a civilian military government. Um, at first, it was started with a military general establishing a revolutionary council, who in 1974, after establishing a constitution, took off their, clo uh, took off their clothes, they took off their uniforms, <laughs> and put on longis. And so, Bojok uh, Nguyen became U Nguyen. Um, but in a sense, it was still very much a command economy, socialist orientation. Um, economic nationalism was key. Moving away from the connectedness that the previous governments had, this was seen by some scholars as being a period of reprieve, of, of making Myanmar great again, uh, moving away and, and returning into itself to, um, to, to perhaps heal the wounds from the exposure it had uh, during the colonial period. Foreign investment was reduced, um, and the economy uh, uh, started to focus on a different orient. Uh, different trajectory. This is also a very interesting time, a, a period that I would, I'm still very interested in looking at and um, doing some work on in terms of the creation of a national identity, a national culture. A Buddhist past is emphasized during this time. Um, an agricultural sector has been emphasized following perhaps China's, uh, China's uh, economic um, priorities as well. But during this time, it was the urban sector that began to stagnate because of the focus more on the, on the, rural, on the rural communities. Um, and during this time, also minority experiences, both in the histories and in the museums, as well um, as uh, in their languages and cultures, were, were um, marginalized or they weren't as emphasized as much as a more Burman culture and Burmese culture. English also uh, use was demoted, although I hear because I was doing a project on the making of a national language um, where I gathered old lang language teachers and old language officials together. And apparently, Ne Win understood after a few years that he had made a mistake about switching to Burmese for nationalist reasons and for these credentials. And it was after talking to Lee Kuan Yew, apparently, that he, that, uh, he was convinced that he had to switch back uh, to, to start teaching English more aggressively in the primary levels up to at least fifth grade. And what was interesting in these conversations was I brought all these folks together in a table where they were sort of talking about the policies that were going on. The teachers were finally saying to the officials, saying, oh, so that's why we had that stupid policy. And so they were finally being able to actually communicate with each other um, during these, what was a very hard time because you had, you had priorities towards nation building and building some sort of coherency. But at the same time, you had all these different communities, all these different um, uh, linguistic um, groups that wanted their identity essentially preserved during this period. The economic crisis that eventually uh, set upon the country started to uh, reach the surface in the 1980s. Fuel natural uh, gas prices went up, rice prices dropped, um, rice was scarce in the cities. And they went moved um, 
to try to try to address these issues by making attempts to, to which to liberalize the economy in 1987. So there was some indication that he was trying to reform right at the precise moment when um, when many of the riots and, and the protests started to emerge in 88. And in fact, I mean, this is old material, actually. I mean, um, scholar James Gio was talking about this 20 years ago, um, about these types of trends and these reforms that were occurring in, in the late 80s. They went apparently also raised the, the multi-party uh, question about whether they should shift from a single party um, or to a multi-party system. Um, so perhaps um, there might have been a, a different outcome um, um, had people not been suffering for the last 30, 40 years. And it was during the late 80s, that this was the period we'll start to be focusing on, where we have this urban uprising. In March, of, and of course, it's a, a small little in, inconsequential argument that actually becomes a spark, um, at least as part of the narrative, that um, where all the uprisings started. Uh, there was a tea shop incident, uh, s s reportedly an argument between two groups of students about which music should be played. Um, it sounds like an old 1950s movie or something like that. <laughs> but uh, one of the uh, perpetrators um, uh, after the fight got released because of his government connections. This is supposedly this is what the start was. And this upset a, a whole group of students who started protesting this type of favoritism and um, privilege that certain groups had uh, within the country. But I think what's probably far more convincing is the economic argument that it was demonetization, the rise in fuel prices, the rise sh shortages in the cities that also pushed people to, to also um, express their frustration at what was going on. And the compounding this, when they went, is already starting to ask these questions, people saw this as an opportunity um, to express uh, their dissent. Students took to the streets, um, some riots occurred um, throughout um, other parts and districts and suburbs of Rangoon. This part of the narrative is probably more familiar to most people. Um, universities closed, student protesters um, uh, spread to other parts and other parts, uh, cities. The police were having a very difficult time actually managing this. Um, in fact, there was one event um, near the Young Golden Arts uh, Social Science University where 42 uh, uh, kids were killed. And this started to attract the attention of the Western media. I still remember. It was uh, in, I think it was, we were living in DeKalb when this, this all, DeKalb, Illinois, when all this started happening. And, and coming on ABC News, Peter Jennings and showing these, just the shots, you know, of the, of the streets and so forth going on. And suddenly, Myanmar started becoming um, really much a part of our, our discussions. Especially when civil servants and other groups started to join in with the students, making this really a mass general strike. The army replaced uh, the police. Um, and, and brutally uh, so cracked down on these groups. The immediate consequences of the story was that Nguyen and the BSPP dissolved. He didn't dissolve, the party did. Uh, he, he stepped down. Um, but what we saw here, too, was a major transition um, where essentially public order and instability um, started to break down. Even the term for anarchy, if you translate it, actually means to be without a king. And this term was used very much, um, um, by the army when they talked about the fear of, of anarchy being far worse than tyranny. Um, so army seized power, established political administrative economic structures, and the SPDC, uh, not SPD, SLORC, um, was um, uh, established itself as the the new government, which is essentially was a military coup. In doing so, this group of younger generals removed older generals, uh, members of the old BS BSPP. Some were uh, put in prison, others were just discharged, some were put under house arrest, others fled. Many protesters uh, were also thrown into jails. Um, some reports suggested that 10,000 were killed. Many f fled the country. Um, and activists, and became activists in, on the border, uh, on the borderlands of, of the country. The immediate consequences was the uh, that a new power vacuum emerged, which the military filled, uh, but promised to return 
but no one, of course, believed them. This was hard to believe um, a group of generals uh, who would, who would, um, that would return power after having you know, shot into, uh, into crowds and so on. So people realized that this type of democracy movement, which seemed to be timed at a, at a moment in Asian history, where other movements were also going on um, in the Philippines, in South Korea, Taiwan. This seemed to be sort of like the reverse domino effect. Countries were all sort of democratizing um, at the, around the same time. But Myanmar didn't fit that pattern. And I think that was a disappointment to a lot of observers. It ushered in what would be called the third sort of period which, and this is the period that becomes internationalized. This is the period that becomes more f um, familiar with most observers through the efforts you know, of the media and, and transnational organizations. From a long, point of, from a long perspective, um, our colleague uh, Robert Taylor would suggest that this period was really much a, a period of a contest for the state or a contest for power. A contest that really started at the end of the war, um, when people were all trying to fill in the vacuum that had been, evac that had been left um, by the Japanese and by the British. The military, um, the former BSPP leaders, communists, ethnic exiles, student uh, uh, exiles, ethnic armistices, all had different ideas of what the future of the national community would be, who would belong, um, and what system would be begun to run it. Some of these cartoons started to portray this. Um, as you can see in the picture there, with different groups being aligned to different ind individuals, um, each all having very different ideas. I mean, the old saying is, you know, three Burmese get together and you have five political parties. And so this sort of um, this this sort of challenge was facing was mainly because of the existence, um, I think, of a lot of different experiences um, throughout the history, and that's a whole another topic uh, to actually uh, explore. Um, this is where uh, Ron's Burling, the, the, the ideas about community, I think with highland and lowland and I think coastlands as well, peoples are become very pertinent to understanding Myanmar. There was a rise of the opposition group um, with students, public intellectuals, members of the opposition parties, former generals who had been, um, who had been um, not defrocked, but decommissioned, um, were now forming new political parties. And there was a competition amongst many of these different groups. UNU, the old prime minister, um, also came into the, into the picture. We're trying to who's, who's say who was going to be able to speak on behalf of the public. It eventually became the National League for Democracy that took the center stage, especially because of the two patrons, uh, Utenu and Uangji, who were both uh, very powerful former generals, and as well as Daan San Shitsuchi, who at the time was actually not Daw, she was still very young, so uh, she was Aung San Suu Kyi, um, who was uh, at the time the sec secretary of the, of the party. As, as I show in the picture, only three um, had not served under Ne Win. So people have to be reminded that the groups that are part of these opposition were very much elite groups, elites fighting elites. Su Chi be became thrust into, and this is a familiar story, um, as she joins in, in 88, because she happened to be there at the time when her mother was uh, sick. Um, she uh, very much becomes the center figure. Um, she becomes the symbol of, of the party, and also the ideas that it seemed to represent. And, she would, and because they called it the National League of Democracy, obviously they were, they were aligning themselves with what was current at the time also. Because the Cold War had just ended and folks were, were pushing uh, towards um, not talking about things in terms of the free world and the communists, but they were looking at in terms of free world versus authoritarianism. And her, uh, her appeal and, and also her ideology, um, it was infused into this, into this movement. It connected with the times um, that were going in other places, East, Eastern Europe as well, the, as well as other parts of Asia. She was arrested with other top NLD um, leaders in, in 1989, which of course brought her more attention um, by the media who was starting to get very much interested in what was happening uh, in the country. The 1990 elections, which happened um, 
shortly afterwards was partly a result of May Wynn saying we should have uh, multi-party constituent assembly elections. People understood them to be general elections, meaning after you have the election, power would go over. But from what um, studies have shown, both by Bob Taylor and I think Derek Tonkin's article out of Contemporary Southeast Asian Study, they trace back to the exact moments um, where these negotiations were going on about the 1990 um, elections. All the parties knew that this was an election to form a constitutional convention after which they'd form a, co a convention um, and held a referendum and then form a government. The NLD won with 59.87%, um, but they made a new decision to not proceed, and this is where it bec the, the history becomes contested, to fulfill the pre-election agreement. And part of this has to do with the military, and part of this has to do with divisions within the NLD, which my colleague Jolly Line has written about. Essentially, um, there were folks who said, we have been voted in, we should just take power, why do we have to go through this entire process? And so there was moderates, and there were, and there were more, you could say hardliners, and there was dissension and differences already within the NLD at this very point. So when they decided to, to said, we're not going to uh, push through with the Constitutional Convention, some groups were saying the military didn't allow them actually to do it. The military stayed on and said, we will then put the process of building the country together. This is in their view. Um, and uh, we will po pass power over. Few people believed this at the time. I mean, the, the military had very little credibility to, to, to rest upon. The uh, NLD split into different factions over the direction of the country. But there was international uh, pressure that came from the media and, and new groups um, that were being formed, uh, foundation groups, new government positions as well, uh, that started to put pressure on the country. So what are the key points after this, of this period? Well, it's basically the idea that the, after the power vacuum emerged and the military purged former elites, what you had was an opportunity for new opposition members, a new opposition groups to come in. And what has been essentially happening, I would argue, for the last 25, 30 years, is you've been fighting over the future of the country, essentially, and, and, and the right to define it and where it was going to go. But the folks who had the loudest voice, at least globally, were the ones pre precisely being denied a, a space at the table. So we turn finally to internationalization. And this is, a, this is the part of the, of, the, of the project, which I hope will become a book, that is to me the most interesting, is really how was this domestic situation internationalized? How did it become a part? How did she become a, a figure that everybody knew about? Um, how come Bono and U2 were singing about, you know, in, in concerts? How come they made a movie? I mean, what, what and about Suu Kyi and, and so on? How did this become part of, of our regular discourse, at least um, internationally and in, in, in most countries. Part of it, I think, um, and this story has to do with the media's role, and this is, and, and also the transnational uh, advocacy groups, to bring this issue uh, into attention. And, but at the same time, what it was also able to do was able to also bring ideas, certain ideas, and entrench them about how should we understand Myanmar or Burma. Um, I love this picture because it sort of encapsulates the whole thing. By freeing Aung San Suu Kyi, we are freeing Burma. And it was a very, it was a, it was a very um, simple idea that people who study media and who study the work of, of, and mobilization of transnational advocates say, this is what they do. They will focus on a symbol, they will focus on a person, and enable that to encapsulate all of the ideals um, that they are wishing to promote. And so the Burma campaigns were created both here in the States as well as in the UK and other parts of the world. Ann Arbor had a very important role in this. There was a legal case, actually, um, that was, I think, well, I'm still a grad student here, Vic. Um, it was a case regarding this, about targeting companies that did business um, in, in Yama. And there was a case here um, that actually um, became, became headlines um, for that, because that was part of the, part of the ways in which the issue and the campaign became part of a uh, public discourse. Activists and media, we can't blame, simplified the narrative of all these things. Much of the history of the economy and, and so forth were not really part of, of this knowledge at the time. 
But to be fair, how many Burma historians were there <laughs> you know, in the 80s? And so um, there were very few people able to really talk about it or look at it in a very effective way. But the important aspect of this was that it produced a, a dominant discourse of freeing Burma, freeing Suu Kyi, and this idea that this was a democracy movement um, held against its own will by a military government became uh, an, a, a long-lasting trope in our understanding of the country. I'm thinking that, in fact, the dominant discourse, the story of Myanmar can be encapsulated in these one, two, three, four, five, six, 11 or 12 topics that when we think about Myanmar, we think of these things, the rising, the Suu Kyi's imprisonment. Do we call it Burma or do we call it Myanmar? Gosh, that's such an important issue. But this, it even made Seidfeld, you know, as part of a, as part of a, uh, of a, of a, a sitcom. The 1990 elections, the Burmanization um, of ethnic groups, the moving of the capital, you know, to, to the, um, to the sent to Napido, the idea that the that the generals were all superstitious, um, went to soothsayers and so and so on. This sort of orientalizing of, of these folks that made them in, irrational. Of course, the Saffron Revolution. I mean, people, when they thought of Burma, they thought of these things. And so I'm actually thinking that these might be actual, the actual chapters you know, of a book that might actually explore the ways in which this became part of that major narrative. The international response, of course, was sanctions. Asian nations, though, stayed very much engaged. So when the West pulled out through the sanctions, Asian partners went in and developed and continued relationships. With them, Thailand, although it was um, the main base in a sense for um, most of the activists and so forth, Thailand as a government had major trade, as did China, India, Singapore, and a lot of Asian countries. Japan invested heavily also in, in Myanmar during this time. And perhaps it was through Japan that the U.S. also still maintained some of its, of its ties, even though officially it had stepped back. But investment withdrew from, from Burma. And so after a point of isolation, in a sense, of 20 years of isolation between 62 and 88, or more than 20 years, another point of isolation was being instituted from the outside. And so this compounded, any, uh, it compounded some of the problems that the country was facing, especially the social economic ones. But it also um, halted any, any movement towards opening up that was starting to, to occur at the time. Interestingly, reforms you know, were launched um, in the early 1990s and early part of the, of the 21st century. Ironically, the military government also started to adopt democracy as well as part, of their, uh, as part of their rhetoric. So in many ways, you had competing notions of democracy. You had one that the opposition was using and another that was sort of state-sanctioned, state-defined. It was defined through Ken Yunz, who was both the intelligence chief and uh, number two and number three uh, in the ranking who became later prime minister, uh, who established this roadmap to uh, democracy, or a roadmap to discipline flourishing dem democracy through a seven-step process. Now, the interesting thing was, you know, he became prime minister because he knew that through the process, he would have to meet other prime ministers. They didn't have that sort of mechanism in place. To me, that was a signal. They were already starting to trying to open up at a time, of course, when people were trying to, um, uh, to push a different agenda or to force them into a different... Um, or compel them into a different uh, political trajectory. I end it with our, the point of scholarship. Where, how has scholars talked about this period? How has this narrative been understood? I argue there's been an absolute dominant trope, this, this democracy narrative, this democracy framework, that has really, in a sense, reflected the rise in Burma studies since 1988. Before, it was just a handful of folks and some of them are my relatives, you know. Um, and, and what became a small little group of scholars getting together in someone's house every year for a Burma Studies group became an international group. Um, conferences were starting to now be formed, um, not just in small little decal, but they had one in Gothenburg in 2002, and they started switching between an international location and a, and a, and a, and a, a, a U.S.-based location. The, the expansion of the field um, was also because of the attention um, that um, anthropologists, especially in political science, were contributing to the field. This is where the new energy of the field was coming. 
They were looking and asking questions about political repression, democracy, identity, governments, ethnic politics, and of course, Suchi was focused. These are some examples of the books that you see there that were pushing forward this new rise and interest in, in Burma studies. But it was also part of what was connected to the infrastructure of Burma studies that was developing. What do I mean by that? The journals, the conferences, the study groups, the new programs that are starting to develop around the country um, were all s focusing on, on a lot of these ideas. With the exception, perhaps, of Michigan, <laughs> because when we all came, there were five of us, we were all working on pre-modern stuff you know, with, with Vic. We were probably the only places that, that didn't go towards uh, this trend. Um, but most other places started focusing on these questions of democracy, um, of identity, and so on. The expanded public and private sector um, funding from NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, also pushed, gave scholarships, brought folks over from Myanmar to the uh, United States. Um, the Open Society Institute at the Soros Foundation um, with the Burma Project that was being run by my aunt, so it's all in the family here, um, was really a huge part of this entire narrative. And my aunt's now moving towards retirement, so I'm hoping to interview her, um, perhaps with some scotch involved, uh, to get to see what types of connections or what was the involvement of, 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 the, of her outfit um, in, in connection with the development of this narrative. And of course, new faculty positions, language training, um, programs throughout the United States and so forth, new library collections were also contributing um, to this, um, this story um, and the promotion of it uh, through scholarship. Now I, I turn to, though, to a field that Frankly, I had not even thought of until very recently. And I was shocked, if you just go through some of these databases for your dissertations, how many dissertations are actually on Myanmar coming out of media studies. And I think this is where a lot of the energy um, is actually coming from, from these other disciplines that are not necessarily tied to the area studies programs, which is unfortunate. You know, I wish they'd be a little bit more integrated. But they're coming from, from media studies. They're coming from IR. They're coming from these other places that um, that are asking different types of questions, but are all then also um, looking at the role of media in Myanmar's democ democratization. So here I thought I had a very original idea, and I found out there are, there are already existing dissertations that are looking at how Aung San Suu Kyi was produced by the media, for instance, or how have narrative traumas, or trauma, trauma narratives that you get out of psychology, psychology um, can be used as a framework for understanding the ways in which transnational organizations um, create their own narratives, or uh, the ways in which um, these, how these transnational networks actually form in the first place, connecting local uh, adv advocacy groups with more international ones. It's a rich field, actually, that many of us who have um, our, firm, our feet still firmly within area studies and in Myanmar studies, um, we still have to uh, start looking at these areas. So I think some of the point of entries might be in these, these particular areas. It's at that framing, at that customization level, where they fit what's going on locally to fit the funding and campaign priorities and frameworks. It's at that point where I think we might have something more to say. I'm also interested in the, in the ways in which the domestic activists adopt and provide narratives to fit, in a sense, what the market is. And this is in a way of also addressing this whole vis victimization uh, sort of uh, trope where you have all these Burmese who can't speak for themselves, or ethnic groups who can't speak for themselves. When I was speaking to my colleague, Jolly Line, um, about his role when he was on the investigative commission on the west part of uh, the country um, after 2000, I think 2012, when they were investigating the violence with, between Muslim communities and Buddhist communities, he said it was a very odd thing. I think, Al, I'm not sure if you were part of that conversation at, 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 at dinner um, as well. He said, we were going in and we were asking questions. And they had answers that were coming back to us just like this. We think, what's going on here? And then we found out that they were calling the next village using the mobile phones and telling them what the answers were or what the questions were going to be. So they switched the questions on the next village. I feel like this is like a, in class, you switch the exam questions. <laughs> and that threw them off. But what it shows, I think, the important thing it shows is they know the, that groups 
are not helpless. They know how to um, take advantage of and, and position themselves in relationship to the opportunities that are around. They may or may not be necessarily connected to the agenda of the investigators or even the cause, but they are not helpless here. And so these groups are quite savvy. And it took someone, I think, of Jaws' um, abilities to be able to detect these types of uh, nuances. So the ability of, of, of the agency, I think, is very important, which is still an uh, important tro trope for us as Southeast Asianists. And finally, I think it's the connections between you know, the, these advocacy discourses, media discourses, and the scholarship, I think, was, and that their connection is what I'd really like to emphasize. And I also the critique of these sources, the critique of human rights reports, the critique and examination as, as a genre of sources that talk about uh, Myanmar or a particular situation. These types of reports, which are powerful um, and have a lot of sway on how we understand the country, I find are very rarely problematized. And of course, and then here comes the situation about being in a funny position. Because while you value the work that many of these groups do, the humanitarian work especially, um, you don't want to then necessarily critique them and suggest that you're supporting the poverty and challenges that, that they are trying to address. But at the same time, if we're using them as historical sources, how do we engage them? So this is a question I'm trying to figure out. Some scholars have provided ways of thinking about it. And, I, and this one book here about um, the mobilization of empathy and so forth addresses some of these very interesting issues. But again, it's beyond our area of studies brief. And so finally, this is my working title uh, for, the bo for the book. I'm not going to make any friends, I think. Um, but it's interesting that I don't think I could have written this or even thought of putting it together five years ago. But now, I think people are a little bit more open to thinking about it, mainly because they've seen, in the fact, the perhaps more complicated picture of what the NLD represents, the challenges that they're having in government. Certainly, the figure of Aung San Suu Kyi is much more complicated than we, we held uh, before. So I think there's an opportunity here to actually start asking a little bit more about how do we think about these aid and advocacy narratives. More broadly, and this is my, as I said, my connection to, to, to Michigan, is this knowledge uh, production interest and it, the, the broader epistemology of Myanmar. How has this moment produced certain ideas about how we think about the place? And finally, I'm very interested in, in also how have other Asian countries thought about it, not in relationship to the West, but how have they thought about Myanmar in relationship to each other. So for instance, how has Indonesia in, uh, positioned itself in relationship to Singapore's um, perspective on Myanmar? Or how has Japan uh, looked at it in relationship to Korea? Because Korea right now is all over the place uh, in Myanmar, funding and creating a lot of different initiatives. And in fact, taking the place, I think, of what the Japanese were doing in the 1980s. So this is where I am at the moment. Um, thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. We have a few minutes for questions. You have to speak in the mic, otherwise the recording gets lost. <laughs> um, it seems to me that the uh, norm normative appeal of democracy derives in large measure from the economic and military power and, uh, and by extension the prestige of the United States and to a lesser extent Western Europe. And now that that um, may be in decline, at least challenged by China, mm. and, and we see a um, corresponding retreat from democratic formal commitments in the case of Turkey, other mm. Mideastern countries in Thailand, Philippines, parts of Eastern Europe, um, do you think that the rise in, in this regional context of China, or how, how do you think it will affect the um, nominal commitment to democracy on the part of the leaders of Burma? It'll depend on who you ask. Yeah. I think. I'm asking you, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think right now um, there are folks who are absolutely committed to the cause of democracy, the institutions, the material developments, and so forth that's associated with it. There are these groups in the leadership that are very much, I think, connected to it. But you also have other constituencies who have ties towards China. 
and I think these guys are at odds with, with each other. And if the U.S. doesn't maintain its engagement and its pivot, you know, towards the country um, for a much longer period than particular administrations, you know, cycles, um, I think the focus on um, socioeconomic priorities are going to be valued higher, more highly than um, perhaps the, the ideological ones that are associated with, with democracy. Right now, I think um, with 70% you know, of the population still rural, I think the priorities for most of those folks are still very much bread and butter issues. Um, whereas I think in the cities, they had the luxury perhaps of, 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 of thinking perhaps um, about higher sort of standards of ideals and so on. Um, and also, there, the Asian partners that are investing in, 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 in Yama also have an influence, too. Um, Singapore's um, interest is, is purely really economic, and, and so they are a major important priority, um, a partner for them. So I, I, and if they're not really, and if they, as well as ASEAN, is not as, as, um, are not prioritizing these ideals um, as much, I think, um, the chances for some of these the liberalization, this momentum, uh, may wane if the particular government says, "Well, look, we have to prioritize reconciliation first, you know, before we even think about, you know, civic education and, and so forth." Um, but I think because China is still such a major player, its regional partners are also very much a part of Myanmar's development. I think that certain pragmatic ideas are probably going to, you know be prioritized over others. Uh, <clears throat> to my surprise, uh, I'm a witness to a very small part of your project. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to uh, dearly departed friends, Rhodes Murphy and Eleanor, oh, yeah. who had spent a year in Oxford uh, following which, um, Marcel and I went to Oxford and arranged to rent the apartment that Rhodes and Eleanor mm. lived in in mm. Park Town and to buy the 11-year-old Peugeot <laughs> they had been driving. And in between their departure and our arrival, the Peugeot was in the possession of someone two doors down named Ma Michael Aris. Oh. And when we went to meet Michael Aris and collect the car, his first words to me were, I learned driving in Bhutan, <laughs> which was his way of saying, the roads are very peaceful in Bhutan, and he wasn't used to city traffic, and the car had been hit by a bus <laughs> and was in the hospital. <laughs> so I got to know the husband of Aung San Suu Kyi, who is prevented from visiting her, and whom she could, she could not even come to his funeral mm. uh, when he died a few years later. And I met also the youngest son Kim. of the two who couldn't go to Burma to visit their mom, mm. whose passports were invalidated, and so on and so forth. Anyway, Michael, of course, spearheaded the program of getting a Nobel Prize for Aung San Suu Kyi, which would have solved his personal problem for sure, his family problem as well as the national <laughs> problem, <laughs> and as part of this I internationalization. Yes. I mean, I think he was a key figure in, right. yeah. in that whole media push, the internationalization of, of her and her leadership. Yeah, I, I agree. So I'm available to be interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tom, you're exactly right. I mean, it was the um, it was the efforts of individuals as much as it was media and, and advocacy groups that were very much a part of of uh, uh, bringing that story, you know, to the world, you know, in, in a sense and. Um, yeah, Kim and uh, and Alex, um, they suffered a lot, you know, not, not being able to see their see their mom. I mean, eventually, you know, it happened, but um, still, that's it's a it's a massive sacrifice for 
everyone involved. I mean, we knew them in Kyoto when, in 86. We were all there in Kyoto University. I was 13. Alex was there. Kim was there. And uh, Auntie Sue was there, too, the one floor below us. And, and this was before things, before she got thrust into the limelight, you know, and, and so forth. Um, but she was just like any other, any other woman. I, I always remember the first time I met her, um, I was 13. They were, my dad was having an argument, surprise, surprise, uh, <laughs> with some British-sounding woman. And so I expected to see someone Caucasian coming out, and it was actually her. And they were arguing about Burmese history, you know, and, and so on. But so we got to know her, you know, qu quite well. Um, uh, I never, we never met uh, Michael, but um, he he was a huge factor um, uh, in in her image, and as well as the movement more broadly, because the Nobel then connected that and Burma's experience with South Africa and so other sorts of places. So that also, as you said, um, really internationalized it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Tom. Ken, yeah. Yeah. Um, we've been told that one of the things that's taking place within China, uh, we're sorry, with uh, Myanmar today, is a reassertion of Chinese identity within the community, and especially marked by the reopening of ancestor temples that are now acceptable then within that environment. The reason I ask that is kind of pick up on your topic of knowledge production in this mm, case, mm, mm. where it's okay now to be open in terms of different mm. knowledge production and community mm -hmm, that is mm -hmm. here, and where this is going then relative to the potentials of really laying a really solid foundation for, again, a different type of democratic environment that is here that goes along with that, where, again, the acceptance of then the diversity of identity is acceptable within the state. Is that a valid argument that can be made here, or where do you stand? Um, yeah, I think... Again, there's been, there is more space, and we've seen that be expressed in both positive ways, as you've been talking about, with uh, communities being able to, to um, do, proceed with ancestor worship and so forth. But we've seen the ugly side of that as well, you know, with groups now coming up with more space, being able to say what they want on the internet, um, the, the right wing folks, which are causing a lot of the problems you know, in the West and so forth, um, are, are really causing the government and, and society you know, a lot of problems. Um, that openness, yeah, is, is very important um, in the sense that people can now reflect upon their, their minority identity and so forth, perhaps with less, uh, less pause than they might have had before. Um, at the same time, this is, this is at a time when the nation actually, or the nation state is still, in a sense, being imagined, starting to be produced. Um, I still think about, you know, obviously, Vic's work you know, integration in, in pre-colonial Southeast Asia and the rest of the world, and everywhere, actually. <laughs> but I also think about, you know, it, it, what is this period? What are we dealing with here? And with, I think what we're dealing with is, is a period um, where we've had a period of fragmentation, and they're still trying to figure out what it means to be together and you're going to have a tension between these types of developments you're, you're talking about and the attempt to bridge and to create consensus and coherency when you have on the on the ground a lot of division a lot of um, a lot of factionalism and 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 disconnections which makes of course the whole process of nation building much harder and then we have a time then everyone else is saying Nation's actually not so important anymore. We should be thinking transnational, actually. We should be thinking about the borders. So this has really been, um, I think, a challenge for folks to sort of find that balance again. I mean, um, how do, does one express their, their affiliation and their belonging to both a local community as well as maybe a more national or, or even regional one? That was wonderful, Admetri. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could comment on how much of this image creation you think was uh, purposeful, uh, whether, whether this was uh, whether this was curated uh, um, on the part of Ansang Suchi and and you know those those around her, or how much she's almost sort of a victim of her own you know of uh, yeah. of circumstance, uh, and I guess the the, the the what prompted this was the 
in, in some respects, the lack, the, the surprising lack of response uh, since she's ascended to power in terms of burnishing and, and protecting that image, um, uh, which doesn't make sense if you sort of think of her as, the, as one of the chief actors and drivers of, oh. of creating and establishing that image in the first place. Makes more sense if, if this was something created around her in which she didn't, you know, she was a minor player or not, you know, not, not the sort of lead, lead player in that, yeah. in that image creation. My sense is that she um, was not a part of it, but she certainly benefited from it and enjoyed it while it was there. But now she's seeing the, the difficult parts about having those expectations on her. Um, this expectation that she could do no wrong, that she was this Joan of Arc and so forth. Um, she finally had to sort of, in a sense, almost lash out at the press and said, I've always been a politician first and foremost. You know? But it's you guys who <laughs> made me, in a sense, this person. And you know, some scholars have even suggested that, in fact, she never changed in the last 25 years. But it was the context that changed. And that's why she's seen to be, in a sense, now um, in a much more precarious position. And uh, so in some sense, yeah, she, she benefited and probably contributed to it, pushing forward the narrative. Um, house arrests, some have suggested, actually benefited her, you know. Um, and this has actually rubbed other activists the wrong way, those who were in insane you know, prison and so forth, the Mathengis and, and, and other folks who um, did the hard time and so forth. And now they are actually voicing their opinions about this more, um, more, more publicly, to go back to Ken's uh, statement, um, that now they feel the space says, no, we can actually challenge Suu Kyi and the NLD government, and they will in the next elections. So we have folks who use, uh, before affiliated themselves with her who are now starting to depart. So she very much is going to feel the brunt of this change in, in the setting. See, I would agree that this is, uh, it was mainly produced by people outside who, um, in a sense, were commercializing it, you know. Okay, um, just a, a comment and a quick question. One, I, I was sitting in Chengdong uh, this summer and channel surfing, and the, ra the third Rambo movie came on, oh, which yes. is set in a kind of a Hollywood version yeah. of Cayenne or Sean State. And it seems like that's probably a source of a lot of these narratives, too, right, about mm. Burman uh, oppression of ethnic minorities. Um, but my question, you, you just mentioned Joan of Arc, and that goes to the heart of my question, which mm. is how much gender, how much a, of a role does gender play here? Um, it's very kind of Mother Teresa-like. Um, it is. Yeah. The narrative of, of this martyr, perfect yeah. figure. I think gender is very much a part of this. Um, and, uh, and, and scholars much better equipped than I have, have written, uh, Therapitan, uh, Teresa Ho, um, um, uh, Chia Kea have all written you know, on women, um, and they've all connected it, their work in, in, in one way or another to also more recent events and Suu Kyi as a figure. And I think, yeah, the, the mother figure is very much important, and one can't help but also you know, think about Mother India you know, as part of a nationalist sort of image you know, um, that was very much part, part of that political mo mobilization. And I think the gender aspect is, is is very strong because the fact that her movement was, in a sense, a nonviolent one um, appealed very much to the international foundations and so forth. It's something they could support. If it was a, a leader, a male leader, it might not have been quite as evocative. You know, because here you have a lady standing um, up to the, to, the, to the bullies, basically, to the generals. And I think that, that the gender aspect as very much a part, uh, an important aspect of the, this internationalization. Um, she's a, you know, people see that she's a beautiful woman that's standing up, um, and she has, she's Western educated. It fulfilled all, you know, the Orientalist uh, imaginings, you know, of, of what um, one would have hoped, perhaps, to, to be a symbol, and, and she was perfect. What was interesting was we started seeing hints of people to replace. You know, there was other women um, activists who were starting to be put up and being honored and so forth. And I couldn't help but wondering if, you know, the new generation was already being groomed, you know, to sustain the cause. But then, of course, the generals did a, a very inconvenient thing and 
democratized uh, to some extent, which made all those efforts uh, rather moot. But no, so yeah, Michael, I think absolutely gender is a big part of it. Yeah. Nick, did you? I, yeah. I just wanted to add to yeah. Tom and you was giving the, the uh, Michigan Down Sun Sushi connection. I had a third. Okay. I applied for a job here to teach uh, uh, Burmese in the Department of Asian Languages oh, really? in 87. <laughs> and she, did, she didn't get the job. I, I don't know quite why, but if she had gotten the job, quite likely she would not have been in Rangoon in 1988. The, uh, yeah, the yeah. Well, we yeah, we'll be here today. Thank you again all for having me. Yeah.